Hello, and welcome to another episode of David Weaver's Sustainable Tourism, interpreted by T.H. Culhane. That's me. This week, we're looking at Chapter 6, Attractions. Topics included in the chapter are Role of Attractions, Typology of Attractions, Attraction Characteristics, Ownership and Orientation, Spatial Configuration and Situation, Authenticity, Presentation and Image, Scarcity and Status, Carrying Capacity and Accessibility, Market, theme parks, sustainability-related issues, environmental and economic considerations, Disney World, sustainable initiatives, Disney examples, other initiatives, casinos, perceived economic benefits, Indian casinos, economic and sociocultural costs, negative economic impacts, negative sociocultural impacts, problems in Indian casinos, sustainability initiatives, AGA and other programs, ski resorts, expansion and consolidation, environmental impacts of skiing, corporations and real estate, displacement and diminished sense of place, sustainability initiatives, golf courses, environmental and sociocultural impacts, sustainability initiatives, situation and site consideration, and the on-the-ground example, how Disney was defeated at the Third Battle of Manassas, Virginia. Of course, we're not going to talk about all that in my relational summary. We're going to do my interpretation of the most important parts of the chapter for me, and then it's up to you to mine the chapter for some of the topics that relate to you. So let me start with my relational summary of Chapter 6. Here's what I got out of it. When I was in graduate school for urban planning at UCLA, living off the grid at the Los Angeles Urban Echo Village, where I had built an indoor composting toilet and water recycling system, eating organic food from our permaculture garden, riding my solar-charged electric bicycles to campus an hour each way, and earning a reputation among my peers for being a radical environmentalist, I caused some confusion when I got my yearly season passes to Universal Studios theme park, to Knott's Berry Farm, the California Adventure, and of course, the Magic Kingdom of Disneyland. People in my environmental policy cohort thought there was something terribly inconsistent about somebody who worked on urban gardens, frequented bohemian book readings and rallies for low-wage workers' social justice and Indian rights powwows, spending every other weekend in a theme park. They grudgingly understood that my strategy was sound from a student's time management perspective. It was how I got my reading done for my classes. See, I would stand in line for an hour or so at a time, waiting for a ride like Peter Pan or Pirates of the Caribbean, highlighter pens in my hand, my face buried in my graduate reader or textbook, like as if I was Belle in Beauty and the Beast, oblivious to my surroundings and protected by the anonymity of the crowd from any distractions, getting an enormous amount of reading done, focused reading, mind you, and then I would clear my head with a five or ten minute roller coaster or fantasy ride. As soon as the ride was over, my head was clear, I was ready to plunge into another complex academic article. My feet and my arms would get tired sometimes, but it was a great way to stay motivated to study all weekend instead of wasting time. And I could claim some eco-friendly consistency with my principles, as I did ride the notoriously bad public transit system from LA to Anaheim, which took me over two hours each way. Another great opportunity to get undistracted reading done. And so my carbon footprint getting to Disneyland was incredibly low. But it wasn't easy for folks who weren't inside my head to see how my weekends at the theme parks could be anything other than a strange contradiction from Mr. Sustainability. But that is because very few people who don't study our subject know that Walt Disney, the Innoventor, and his company of Disney Imagineers who invented the modern theme park are also the market leaders in sustainability initiatives. That and actually, a trip to the Disney parks is one of the best opportunities to see sustainable mass tourism in action. Weaver affirms, quote, Disney's broader ethos of environmentality, launched in 1990, is reflected in the extensive use of native plants and landscaping, measures to prevent the escape of exotic species, the use of organic pesticides, and the use of water hyacinths, otherwise a noxious exotic weed, and native plants to treat wastewater. It also led in 1995 to the establishment of the Disney Wildlife Conservation Fund, which funds selected projects of nonprofit wildlife and conservation organizations. Other measures include various community outreach programs, recycling and waste minimization activities, and reductions in water and energy use. Although the formation of the Reedy Creek Improvement District is cited as a potential problem for sustainability because it concedes planning and land use control to the Disney Corporation, it can be argued that the internalization of power, 
is a major factor that has allowed the company to implement new standards of environmental sustainability and to create landscapes that juxtapose heavily built theme park facilities with large areas of relatively undisturbed natural habitat. Disneyland Paris has also been touted for its many environmental and socio-cultural innovations, both internal and external, but for very different reasons of extensive state intervention." End quote, page 97. Of course, this surprised many in my crowd at UCLA and the Echo Village because of the negative stereotype that theme parks have in the sociological and anthropological literature. Weaver tells us that the literature, quote, variably implicates the mega theme park and the Disney operations in particular as a potent symbol of globalization, infantilization, inauthenticity, alienation, stereotyping, technological utopianism, hypersanitization, escapism, decontextualization, standardization, frivolous consumerism, corporatism, or some other aspect of the postmodern sociocultural critique. The not-so-subtle anti-corporatism and anti-Americanism of this literature and the centrality of the Disney theme parks in particular is evident in Ritzer and Liska, 1997, who perceive theme parks as the progenitor and extreme expression of McDisneyization, a process that personifies the negative conventional mass tourism ideal type depicted in Table 3.1. From the perspective of sociocultural sustainability, Weaver continues, one broad message of the critics is that people who visit theme parks assimilate the values that these facilities represent. Fjellman, 1992, for example, argues that Disney's Future World, a themed section of the Orlando-based Disney World, sends the message that technology will solve all environmental issues and that corporations are the best means through which to achieve this. It is further contended that these subliminal and not-so-subliminal messages subsequently influence the visitors' day-to-day -day patterns of shopping and entertainment, thereby contributing to the McDisneyization of the culture and society as a whole. End quote, page 95. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, when I was in my master's and PhD program studying regional and international development and environmental analysis and policy, it was fun to beat up on the mouse using Michael Sorkin's postmodern classic, Variations on a Theme Park, and Foucault's lenses of discipline and punish and skewed power relations in the Panopticon to use Disney as the obvious straw man to pick on whenever you needed a Disney villain. But it reflects a poor understanding of what Disney himself was trying to achieve and what has been done by his Imagineers since his untimely death. You see, Disney was an optimist who believed in the enterprising spirit and ingenuity and the idea that his theme parks would never be finished, but would evolve through the stated ideal of being, quote, the happiest places on earth, end quote. Sources of perpetual delight for children of all ages. There was no final word on development, according to Disney, who was also the pioneer in nature films and wildlife and cultural documentaries. Each generation would learn from the last and try to improve upon it, and his philosophy was more like the Brundtland Report definition of sustainability than almost any other enterprise. He had no desire to get rich by robbing the future to meet the needs of the present. He was already rich when he started the parks. His ultimate goal for his parks was to create a living, breathing, globalized city that celebrated all cultures and all stories and the best practices for the healthiest human and natural habitats possible. He called the pinnacle of his life's work Epcot, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, and insisted it always reflect new knowledge and maintain the values of fairness and honesty and imagination and freedom and the pursuit of happiness for healthy families. Epcot was a utopian dream, and though it never succeeded in turning into a real form of urban planning after Walt's untimely death, Disney's original vision has nonetheless still inspired generations of visitors to dream bigger and conceive of a real Tomorrowland that at least gives us a chance to live happily ever after in this time of looming ecological and economic collapse. Empty rhetoric? Too much techno-optimism? When I was a high school science teacher in the mid-1990s in the inner city, I was given a chance to come to Florida from LA to take a behind-the-scenes tour of the science behind the magic. Disney had a program to help science teachers develop exciting curricula in physics, chemistry, and biology, and environmental science by showing us how they deal with the challenges tourism operations face using good science. As Weaver's quick to point out, quote, 
By their very nature, theme parks are conspicuous, intensely built, and enormous generators of waste products such as sewage, greenhouse gases, gray water, pesticide residues, and debris from food products, packaging, etc. While the amount of space actually required for a theme park is often surprisingly small, with only 57 of Disneyland Paris's 2,000 hectares occupied by the intensively visited core facilities, according to Camp 1997, complementary and facilitating land uses and activities typically account for a much larger amount of space. Camp estimates that the average European theme park has a 20 hectare parking lot, capable of accommodating 5,800 vehicles. Theme park companies also tend to establish the theme park and help to extend and internalize tourist expenditures. Land is also often held in reserve for purposes of future expansion. Beyond the land held by the corporation, Disney World, by way of illustration, consists of an 11,100 hectare property, theme parks serve as magnets of unintentional growth poles that attract large amounts of direct indirect and induced development activity to their activity. End quote, page 96. And this is true. They do tend to increase urban sprawl and unsightly strip malls and motorways and business parks that spring up in their midst. But in the case of Disney, they openly try to deal with these realities. For example, on another trip I took in the year 2000 or so, this time when I was an employee of the horticulture division of the Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens, to share sustainability ideas with the staff of Disney's Animal Kingdom and the Magic Kingdom, as well as SeaWorld and Universal and Busch Gardens landscaping people, I got another behind-the-scenes tour of four different theme parks, led by their scientists, to discuss their efforts to reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides and inorganic fertilizers, and to maintain native and endemic species and conserve water. Some were beginning to use their huge parking lot spaces to introduce permeable pavement, for groundwater recharge, constructed wetlands, native vegetation, solar electric generating shade canopies, and energy efficient lighting. They have the money and the clout to do these things. Back in LA a few years later while beginning my college teaching career, I was invited to bring my global environmentalism students from UCLA to a behind the scenes tour of environmental Disney led by the lead scientists on the project, who showed us how they not only recycled everything from water to garbage, noting that in the Florida park they actually produce over five megawatts of electricity from food waste through a biodigester, but how they had completely redesigned Tomorrowland so that it not only had a majority of native plants, but when it came to exotics, had edible plants. They were pioneering the idea of reflecting the need for urban farming in the future with edible landscaping. The only problem they faced was that when they called attention to it with signage, people started eating the vegetation. And while it was safe because they used no herbicides or pesticides, the plants are being damaged. So they removed the signs, but they kept the edible plants, using it as a feature for student visitors, but keeping the information from the general public secret. Still, because I went to the park all the time, I frequently met immigrant families, mostly from Central America, who knew edible plants when they saw them, grazing on the landscape to add to their picnic, and this was allowed. But it also made an incredible statement to the world, that Disney parks change with the times and the needs of society and reflect the sustainability mandates called for by the best thinkers on the subject. The public learns all about urban and vertical farming at Epcot on the ride in the land pavilion. And in Disneyland, they were putting the ideas they experimented with at the Florida park into practice in the California park in a place that had been mocked by California Greens like myself as Yesterland prior to the renovation. Now in certain cases, it is true that even Disney has been beholden to corporate forces beyond the control of their Imagineers. When my students asked why the Autopia in Tomorrowland still had fossil fuel burning cars in 2003, as it still does today in 2016, looking like they came right out of 1950, and looks like a ride designed to teach kids how to sit in noisy, smoky traffic. Our tour guide hemmed and hawed and told us that, well, they had made great gains by getting new kiddie cars that didn't need to idle, spewing smoke all day, but turned on only when the gas pedal was pushed. He then said they would soon be switching to some natural gas, which was cleaner. When asked why they didn't use fast electric cars like the Germans do in their movie land theme park, he said, well, market surveys showed that kids here in the U.S. want to hear the roar of the engine for the experience. 
When asked why they didn't simply simulate the engine growl using recorded samples, these are Imagineers after all, he finally threw up his hands and said, okay, you got me. Look, we aren't generally supposed to tell anyone, but the ride was sponsored by Exxon, and we have sponsorship from General Motors, and they discouraged us from changing the ride. In the European and Tokyo and Hong Kong parks, however, things can be done differently, and are. Similarly, California has a more progressive sustainability futurist Tomorrowland than Florida, reflecting a heightened demand for such visions of the future by Californians. Now in Florida, one glaringly obvious unsustainable practice is that the trams and buses taking people from the massive parking lots to the parks still burn smelly, toxic diesel fuel. In Europe and Asia and California, not only the Disney trams and buses are cleaner, burning natural gas for the most part, but even the normal municipal city buses are cleaner. Even Los Angeles' buses are all either natural gas burning or a going hybrid. So it isn't that Disney is necessarily hypocritical. It's that it's using its presence as a massive international player to try out different sustainability ideas and technologies in different areas without alienating its core supporters in any given locale, gently nudging the industry forward. For example, when it comes to the associated sprawl, Disney made a deal with Orlando that because its own theme park, and it's not the only one in Orlando, and its own resort expansions would cause more traffic and demand more roads and create more indirect land use, Disney alone would in turn restore wilderness and buy and convert abandoned farmland, turning it back into natural wilderness or sustainable recreation areas. They led me to a new preserve outside the parks in Florida that actually has seen the comeback of several endangered species. Weaver sums it up by saying, quote, as with hotels and other built tourism-related facilities, theme park operators practice sustainability at least to the extent that they adhere to environmental and social regulations required by various levels of government in destinations where they operate. Beyond such mandatory compliance, voluntary measures include the allocation of land for environmental purposes. About one half of the total holdings of Disney World, Weaver says, consists of green space or water that's not intended for any future built development. This includes a 3,000 hectare wildlife management conservation area and 485 hectares of restored or enhanced wetlands. Disney also purchased a nearby 4,850 hectare cattle ranch, which it then donated to the Nature Conservancy to be managed as a restorative protected area known as the Disney Wilderness Preserve end quote, page 97. But Weaver also notes that, quote, the natural appearance of the former initiatives is somewhat misleading in that these lands were part of a massive process of deliberate environmental restructuring involving dredging, rechanneling, infilling, and contouring of Disney-owned lands to facilitate the establishment of the constituent theme parks and create an aesthetically pleasing buffer zone, Failman 1992. The problem with this criticism in my mind is that it smacks of the old debate about whether man is part of nature or not. You wouldn't criticize a beaver for doing this, or a bee. There are those who see human beings as an aberration, as a cancer, as a scourge, as a virus, as a pox on the land. Coming from a Judeo-Christian theological position that humans are not animals, that we did not evolve, and are distinct from the natural world, for better or worse, some people have decided that we're more demons than angels and can only do harm. Restoration ecology is an alien concept to such thinkers, and rather than analyzing our impact on its merits, the trend is to celebrate untrammeled, pristine wilderness and assume that when humans touch the land, it bears the mark of Cain. This topic is well explored by William Cronin in his masterpiece, The Trouble with Wilderness, or Getting Back to the Wrong Nature. But when it comes to the original Disneyland, for example, an ecologist's point of view would be that the biodiversity quotient is so much higher in the parks than that of the pesticide and herbicide and fossil fertilizer laden monoculture citrus groves it replaced in Orange County that it is an overwhelming improvement from the rural landscape that was there before. Since I worked as a botanical surveyor for the Los Angeles Zoo, I was also in touch with the Disney horticulturalists working on the botanical palette of the park and they have more species of trees and shrubs and more wildlife than any of the surrounding land uses, particularly farmland. And the story isn't over yet. 
with each conference and gathering of ecologists and environmentalists and sustainable tourism advocates and an ever more vocal public demanding a better overall tomorrow land, fantasy land, and adventure land than the ones offered by contemporary society that we all live in. These parks and others inspired by them and learning from the collegial idea sharing that we were involved in in our American Zoological Horticulture meetings with the theme park groups, things improve. It's gratifying to know that the largest corporations involved in these fantasy landscapes, while making no apologies for the artificial nature of their spaces, are doing a lot to incorporate real nature and its sustainability imperatives in their attractions, as artificial as they may be. In the typology explored by Weaver in Chapter 6, he singles out theme parks, casinos, ski resorts, and golf courses as, quote, four types of specialized built attraction that are prominent within the private sector tourism industry, end quote. As Las Vegas leads casinos into becoming ever more like theme park attractions, they begin to follow the footsteps of giants like Disney. Now, I've focused in my relational summary for this chapter on theme parks because we at the University of South Florida are close to Orlando, the major center of this form of tourism. The book also explores the paradoxes of the other types. Weaver indicts many golf courses because, quote, there is at present no precise definition of a naturalistic golf course, and often such credentials are claimed solely on the basis of reduced energy inputs that serve primarily to improve the profitability of the course, end quote. On page 104, he speaks of the, quote, scorched earth philosophy of golf course development that, quote, eradicates and restructures the natural topography, soil, hydrology, and biology of the site to meet the alleged needs of the game and the huge requirement of water, 6,500 cubic meters per day, enough to meet the needs of 60,000 villagers in many developing countries, the use of enormous inputs of pesticides and fertilizers, two tons a year in the 1990s, which contaminate groundwater, and he talks of a development in Thailand which has been, quote, associated with forced displacement of local residents, land inflation, and illness from acute chemical poisoning, end quote. He also talks about laudable best practice golf courses, like the ones I mentioned in Chapter 1's relational summary that I visited in Sumatra and Palm Desert, California, where, quote, measures are taken to attract and sustain native wildlife, end quote. Once again, as we discussed at the end of Chapter 5's summary, the onus is on us to demand more sustainable resorts because the best practice models are out there. There just isn't sufficient confidence by the developers in the market potential of sustainability investments to convince them to go in that direction. Ski resorts are another area Weaver explores, and again, there are good examples and a lot of bad examples. The point of bringing golf courses and ski resorts up is to give us a lens through which to view these attractions' direct and indirect effects and not just assume that just because golf courses and ski mountains appear green in color because they're attractions based on green vegetation, not just to assume that they're also green in terms of sustainable practice. Both, interestingly, have their greatest negative impact not because of the slopes or the courses themselves, which can be done by a good designer with minimal impact on wildlife or habitat, but because the real moneymaker for both of these industries is the affiliated real estate projects surrounding them that they depend on to generate profits. According to Weaver, it turns out from an economic perspective that the golf courses and ski runs are, quote, secondary products that serve as a hook to attract seasonal or permanent residents. Housing developments are usually situated within narrow riparian valleys or ecologically sensitive areas, which have the effect of displacing wildlife that depend on these scarce habitats for adequate food and cover. Road networks, enhanced airports, and a suburbanization effect cause deleterious environmental impacts no matter how green the attractions themselves can be made to appear. And from a social sustainability perspective, they cause suburbanization and gentrification, which has included the displacement of lower income residents to less expensive communities, often far removed from their jobs in these resorts. And in addition, these processes have eroded the sense of place that distinguish one resort town from another, replacing it with a homogeneous monotony inhabited and patronized by the privileged." End quote. Ironically, this is one of the reasons I actually feel better hanging out at theme parks than resorts. I may appear lowbrow to my academic compatriots as I stand in line with the usual rabble, but to me, they are all, as Sorkin says, variations on a theme park. 
The problem for me is that with ski lodges and golf courses and other exclusive resorts, you're led to believe you're somehow out in nature and that what you're doing is healthy not just for you, but for our environment. For me, however, the elitist nature of the activities makes it seem like the creation of a nature that goes against the better part of my human nature. When land is developed so we can indulge in sports that for centuries have always been associated with the very privileged few who can afford to spend their days uselessly going up and down mountains or hitting little balls about, and these games for the few are impacting the environments we all depend on, I get my feathers up. In theme parks, by contrast, I sometimes feel a sense of community with the masses. We all know the environment is man-made and inauthentic, but we celebrate its magic because in a well-designed theme park, you're allowed to engage in a shared dream, a collective dream of imagineering, the dream that if we all put our minds to it and use our ingenuity and stick to itivity, as Walt Disney would say, the Tomorrowland we end up in in reality might just be enough like that fantasy land where we live happily ever after that it is a place worth going to. And that may be the most important gift to the sustainability movement that the attraction sector of the tourism industry can offer, the idea that dreams actually can come true.